if I had a talking picture of you. I would run it every time I felt blue. I would give ten shows a day and a midnight matinee if I had a talking picture of you. I was born in Southampton on July the 3rd, 1927, and christened Henry Kenneth Alfred Russell. And the first thing I remember was Mum and her sister discussing the week's films. Not much on this week, S. What's on at the Kings? Old Mother Riley. Oh. I won't stand for it. I won't stand for it. Stand for what, Mother? I've worked in this washhouse ever since it was a blue and let me tell you that I can be as gentle as anyone. Well, you're not it's Arthur Lucan and Kitty McShane. He's a bloke dressed up, and she's his wife. I hear they don't get on. I'm not surprised. And who wants to see a film about Wash Day Blues? Enough to give you the, um... What do you expect, <laughs> Moo? <laughs> it's a British picture. <laughs> What else is on? There's John Barrymore in General Crack. I fancy a musical myself. Oh, look! Putting on the Ritz! Oh, that looks good. Let's go. I went along too, before I could walk. Like me, the talkies were still in their infancy, but I was just as happy with the old silent films you could show on the living room wall. Felix the Cat, who kept on walking, was one favourite, and so was Betty Boop, who made me want to visit the South Sea Islands. My home movie projector was little more than a hand-cranked magic lantern, but to me, it was truly magic, for you could conjure up your friends whenever you felt like it. But they were all short subjects, and over almost before they began. So I looked about for something longer. I found it around the corner in a chemist shop that hired out feature films. The fact that they were in German didn't matter. They were silent. So I built extension arms on the projector with my Meccano set and entered a new world. Fritz Lang's Metropolis was top of the bill and still is. The story took place in a city of the future and told of a mad scientist who planned to give his robot the likeness of the pretty heroine he had trapped in his laboratory. Exciting as it was, I began to feel that something was missing. I found it in my Christmas stocking in the shape of a gramophone record. By trial and error, I soon realised that with the March from Things to Come by Arthur Bliss, I also had the power to bring things to life. On the other side of the record was a heroic march by Edvard Grieg, which was too old-fashioned for Metropolis, but really put some fire into Fritz Lang's Siegfried. Soon, I was giving shows to the neighbours in our garage at sixpence a time. The proceeds went to the Spitfire Fund we were at war with Nazi Germany and Southampton was in the front line. More often than not, these shows took place during an air raid. But if the audience saw any connection between the events on the screen and what was going on in the world outside, they never let it spoil their enjoyment of the film. Art knows no frontiers. Now, in case you're beginning to think that I have a one-track mind, I must tell you that I was also mad on trains. 
and not just toy trains. The house in which I grew up was a bit spooky, so I escaped from it whenever I could. Belmont Road was also a bit sinister and devoid of children, so I always set out on my adventures alone, and I preferred it that way. St. Denis Station, less than five minutes away, was my destination, and although it was only a whistle stop, it was on the main line to London, and an absolute paradise for train spotters. But it wasn't numbers I was after, but something far less definable. Excitement, anticipation, and wonderment were all part of it. But the answer was in those approaching clouds which held my secret dreams, and hopefully their fulfillment. Dreams of my favorite film star, Dorothy L'Amour, and the hope of finding her one day on some romantic South Sea island. But for that I needed a ship, and I needed to know how to communicate. I needed a nautical college, only one would have me. I enrolled as a cadet and started learning. ladies were not encouraged in the dormitories, and I was also caught breaking bounds to see Dotty L'Amour in A Loma of the South Seas, and firmly discouraged from repeating the offence. I was also becoming a fan of Betty Grable and her Technicolor musicals, which I even preferred to seamanship, and that's why I volunteered to direct the annual concert. Traditionally, it was the dullest night of the year, with ranks of cadets in uniform singing, The Fishermen of England are working at their nets but I had other ideas. And so I started rehearsing the first drag show in college history. It was a scandal. The first night was my last. I left the next day for the South Seas and that long cherished date with my dream girl. But we sailed to Australia and back without a sign of her. I was devastated. No Dotty L'Amour, and going a bit Dotty myself. The captain was a tyrant. Bly of the bounty was sweetness and light by comparison. I even thought of mutiny, but as I didn't fancy hanging from the yard arm, I jumped ship instead. I broke the news that I was a deserter as gently as possible. But my parents took it badly. Memories of the old man haunted me constantly. Even though the war in the Pacific had been over, he still feared an attack by the enemy and ordered a 24-hour lookout. He feared midget submarines and kamikaze pilots. We kept watch day after day in all weathers. And he watched us too, constantly. A friendly doctor diagnosed an anxiety neurosis and I was officially invalided out of the merchant service. So I stayed at home and discovered the healing balm of music and dreamed my dreams. I dreamed there was once a famous composer who dreamed of a silly film that portrayed him as a painted popinjay who fancied little boys and how amused he was by it. Time to wake up to reality. My parents, tired of my dreaming, presented me with an ultimatum. Join Dad in his dad's shoe shop, or get out from under Mum's feet and join the Air Force. It was no contest. So I volunteered, did my square bashing, and was interviewed for a trade. 
naturally there were questions about my time in the merchant navy, so I mentioned that I hadn't got on with a captain and how the family doctor had certified me mentally unfit for the sea. Dirt won't wash here, laddie. You may not be mentally fit to scrub the barrack square. But if anyone from a group captain to a corporal tells you to scrub the f***er, then you'll get down on your hands and f***ing knees, and you'll scrub the f***er, even if it takes you the rest of your f***ing time, and you won't get no help from the M.O. neither! Now tell me, what do you want to do when you're demobbed? Be a film director. Or failing that, I'd like to stage musicals. Oh, then something in the entertainment line would suit you, like organising camp concerts with a uh, lot of pretty waffs in short skirts kicking their legs up, playing the crotch work, eh, and uh, swinging pits. <coughs> Don't wing at me, laddie, or I'll stick you on a fizzer. I'll have you on jankers for our soul to breakfast time. I'll have your f***ing guts for garters. Name and number! AC2 Russell. What do you think this is, laddie, Scotch Mist? AC2 Russell, Flight Sergeant. Stay you attend you when you sink me! <laughs> and if you think you can scribe your way through the service looking up the skirts of a squad of dancing girls with big knockers hoping for a flash of pussy, then you're in for a shock, laddie! That's why I'm putting you down as a sports film director! You couldn't direct Sweet Fanny Adams! You're nothing but a wanker, Russell! What are you? A wanker, Flight Sergeant! My training took place in a camp we shared with the Royal Navy, and it was a sailor who talked me into a dancing career. A decision which eventually led to a small part in Annie Get Your Gun. Like the Chippewa, Iroquois, Omaha, like those Indians, I'm an Indian too. But it wasn't long before I had second thoughts. A show business career wasn't really for me. At heart, I'd always wanted to be a film director, so naturally I made the rounds of the studios and was turned away through lack of experience. So, with the help of a friend posing as a fashion model and a little smoke, I took up photography, which in turn led to smoke of a sweeter kind and cinematography and the church and film directing. My first effort, Peep Show, was made on a shoestring with the help of friends. That's my future wife, Shirley. That's my landlady. He supplied the coffee and sandwiches. And that man was our star. He was also a recent convert to the Catholic faith and had the knack of making the New Testament sound like amazing science fiction. Soon I was hooked. I, too, wanted to become a Catholic space cadet. He sent me along to a local space sister for briefing. She told me about the great spaceman in the sky who created the universe and made man in his own image. But when it came to mass production, it seems that man was prone to malfunction. His circuits were continually blowing and tripping into the abort and destruct modes. So the great spaceman sent his only son along to fix these defects and program him for an extraterrestrial life potential when his working parts became obsolete. Truly amazing. Then she gave me an awesome communication system called a rosary, which sent coded messages to the great spaceman himself. The countdown began. I gripped the rosary and beamed the message. My cosmic journey had begun. My first stop was the space station where Bernadette had contact with the great space mother. Lourdes is a place of pilgrimage and a place of miracles. At four o'clock every afternoon, the faithful gather in the square in front of the basilica for the procession of the Blessed Sacrament. 